really is quite genuinely an honor to be here. And to try to put some sort of flesh on the bones of a rather nebulous subject, which is the question of, essentially, why the Caspian should be of interest in terms of European energy security. And I'm going to kick off with a little bit on oil, but basically I'm going to talk about gas. Essentially, the biggest problem we have, quite simply, is that even before recession, we had problems with lack of investment in oil and gas. That meant that one didn't really have so much of a problem as we might have thought about whether or not we were going to have peak oil or peak energy, phrases like peak water. The resource base is out there in the world to be developed. <coughs> problem is that the resource base is both expensive to develop and is highly polluting. If you want to consider how much oil there is, you start having to include things like the unconventional oils, the unconventional, the heavy oils, the tar sands of Canada. And then you have to think, how much gas do you need to produce them? And then you have to think, when they first started the really big scale developments in the mid-90s, they thought they would be able to return the land that was being used for the oil sands back to its original condition at the end of each phase. And they've, in fact, found that much harder than they ever imagined. So in extremis, the conventional fossil fuels are out there. But we've known that for coal for ages, and we don't use it nearly as much as we did as a part of our mix. <coughs> and the same is true for oil and for gas. It's there, but it's potentially increasingly expensive, and in the case of oil, increasingly polluting. Then you have a question of time frames. When you look at energy, you're looking at projects that people want to get a return in five to 10 years. That's a long time for many businesses too. And yet when you're looking at climate change, you're having to put investments in now in order to get a result 30 or 40 years down the line. So the question will always be which gets priority. And 90% of the time it's the short term not the long. These are the peaks that I was talking about. My own favorite is peak patience. We run out of time. We get impatient. We don't actually want to take the long-term decisions. It's easier to defer them. And that was the whole point of Nicholas Stern's report on the costs of climate change. The problem is if you don't take action now, it's much more expensive in the long run. Oil. <coughs> Oil is essentially not a problem. Why? Because it's a fungible commodity. What does that mean? It basically means the rich can pay for it. It means that if one oil source goes off the market, whatever is left on the market will be split amongst the world's consumers, or at least those that can pay for it. If you want to take a look at the reactions either to the Arab OPEC <coughs> cut off of the oil embargo of 1973 or to the consequences of the shutting of production during the Iranian Revolution or the crises during the Gulf Wars, you're looking at a world that in effect was able to cope relatively straightforwardly, essentially by means of the price mechanism and by means of the rich countries <coughs> buying what they needed. If there are shortages, they are shortages that hit the developing world. Now, whether or not that's fair or unfair, the horrible thing to say is, it is not a global problem as such. Gas is different. But I'm going to put a little thing, a costings here. We all think of oil in two completely different manners. 
we think of the price of oil per barrel and we think of the price of petrol at the pump. And we do not correlate them. So I was just going to ask you, look at my question five. Cost to consumer in the UK, £1.06 per litre. Anybody know what that is in dollars per barrel? <coughs> Anyone want to make a guess? What? No? Not 500. That's, a, that's an interesting guess. It's about 235. In other words, costs are completely relative. One of the big complaints that OPEC has had is the vast amount of taxation that industrialised states put on their oil. I happen to think that, that that taxation has done two very good things. One, it has made Europe move, use oil far more sensibly because it becomes an expensive resource that you want to use carefully. And that's the reason why, in essence, European oil demand has followed the trajectory it has, which in recent years has been either stable or going down. On the other hand, in the United States, you have a contrary approach in which the price mechanism has scarcely been used. So when you have a crisis, as when price per barrel hit $140, the price of gasoline in the States rose from 2 to $4. What happened then? You had very, very roughly a 10% decline in petrol consumption. It knocked something like 2 million or so barrels a day off the US market, a very important element. Problem, it was only a couple of months before the demand recovered. Prices didn't even have to return to the previous low. So price pays an enormous amount so when the Americans start worrying about the cost of oil in an extreme situation, it's not really that much different from what we're paying as consumers anyway. But gas is the problem. Why? Because gas is still largely bilateral. Essentially, three quarters, a little bit more than that, of all of the gas that is traded across borders comes through pipelines. And the point is also gas is essentially non-interruptible. If you have a supply of gas that you have agreed can be interrupted, you either have to have an alternative supplier or you have to have storage. What you can't do is risk a town or a city being cut off from gas because you have to make sure before you put the gas back on that every single gas outlet is checked. Whereas if you find yourself without oil for a day or two or a week or so, you put the car in the garage or out in the street, and the most you have to do after a long layoff is to check the spark plugs. You do not have to have a complete reconstruction and recheck of the entire system. So gas is inherently more complicated. Now here we come to my version of the problem, which is essentially the problem that confronts Russia. When Russia looks at the European Union in terms of gas, it wants to know how much gas is Europe going to need by way of increased imports. And incidentally, all of these slides are can be made available. I can leave a copy here. You can get them to print it out. You don't have to take the whole table down immediately. But essentially, the point is, if you were looking before the recession, you had a range, according to the price of oil, of perhaps at the low end, an increase in imports of 85 BCM, or at the high end of 154 BCM. Then came Mid-2008, before recession really bit, the new energy policy, finally published in 2000, November, it postulated at high prices, you might even have a decline in imports of 14 BCM. 
That's a decline at a time when you're expecting European gas demand, European gas production, to fall by 80 or 90 BCM. In other words, a very sharp drop in overall European gas consumption. Now, the point is not which of these is right. It's very difficult to work out what's right, particularly when you have a market based on competition. It's that if you're the Russians and you believe in planning, what on earth do you plan for? You have been given a range that at its widest is 168 BCM, which happens to be just about as much as Russia's entire exports to Europe. So what do you do for the future? Particularly, what do you do for the future when you yourself are constrained in terms of the amount of cash you have available for investment. Now, there's also the question of what kind of investment do you wish to make? Do you want to make investments in the form of new pipelines because you think that this is strategically important to be in control of the gas chain as far along the line as possible and at least until you reach your main customers in the European Union? Or do you want to put your money on investment upstream? Now, the EU, and this is not a projection from the EU itself. This is just my general assumption, and I would certainly not wish to be bound hard and fast. I think it is reasonable to argue that the EU is likely to need about 70 BCM of gas increased imports by 2020. Could be a bit more, could be a bit less. I'm just thinking that that's probably a reasonable amount because we're not going to get in full the 2020-20 agreement to curb energy use, promote energy efficiency, and install and introduce renewables. But we'll probably go quite a long way along that route. So we'll still need gas, if only because, for various reasons, gas is the simplest solution. You can build a gas power plant much faster than you can build a nuclear power station. It's, in CO2 terms, relatively clean. You, if you go for wind power, you need it as backup for wind. And it's the obvious, immediate alternative when you're closing down a coal-fired power station. So I think there's a great scope for gas, which is why I tend to think that there probably will be a need for about 70 BCM or so. I wouldn't defend the position much more not least because you've got a much better expert than me on this issue, Dieter Helm, coming to talk to you in the future. And he is going to be far better on the balance of uh, energy resources that can go in to make up the European, Europe's energy demand. But I don't think he would disagree with the concept of around 70 BCM of imports by that time. Question, though, where will they come from? Logically. We know that a number of areas have reasonably predictable expansion programs. We know that Norway has an expansion program that should be capable of producing 20 to 20 BCM over this time, more than it's doing at the moment. We know that Algeria, Libya too, have expansion programs. There's no reason to suppose that they will not come on stream. They might be slightly slower than one expects at the moment, but they are going to be producing a bit more. And we know, predictably, what Qatar will be producing, because Qatar's gas is in the form of LNG, which requires major investments. Those investments are already underway, except a point I should come back to, that is a moratorium on further development of gas that is kicking in very soon. 
But mm. essentially, if you're looking for an extra 70 BCM, those countries should be able to provide pretty much all of it. But it's all predicated on Russian gas supply remaining pretty much constant. And my argument, if I have one simple argument, is to say there is a massive uncertainty of demand, which is a problem for Russia, and there is a massive uncertainty of supply, which is a problem for Europe, an uncertainty of Russian supply. Look at Russian expectations. As late, in fact, as January, it was repeated then, the Russians are still quoting EU figures from 2007. That's another world away. No way is Europe going to be importing anything like that about. So how are the Russians doing coherent, serious planning? That's the 2008 gas balance, and I'm going to come to how it's changed. European gas demand fell roughly 36 BCM last year. Impact of recession. Gazprom output fell 88 BCM. Why should Gazprom fall so disproportionately? Answer, because it was uncompetitive. It was edged out to a large extent by Norwegian and North African gas plus the start of LNG deliveries to Britain, which provided a balancing act at this end of the Atlantic. What are Gazprom's expectations? Down, reduced. They're being realistic. <coughs> now, what are their expectations for the future? Gazprom is anticipating that between now and 30, 2030, i.e., a 23-year uh, framework rather than the 13 or 14-year framework. It's expecting something like 240 to 290 BCM of increased production. What's the IEA projecting? Much, much smaller, 114 BCM. Secondary issue, where is that extra going to be produced and who's it going to go to? I don't think I've put the figures up but one of the biggest problems that one has in dealing with Russia is the very high level of per capita domestic consumption. Russia, on average, uses three times as much gas per capita as the EU. That's not wholly a function of climate. It's not wholly a function of centralised district heating systems, which make sense. An enormous amount of it is waste. An enormous amount of it is the fact that the price mechanism doesn't come into effect. In 2003, the Russians said that they were going to be moving by 2010 to world prices. When they thought that world prices would be around $110, $120. Today, we have world prices in excess of 200, and we've had them approaching 400 or more. Domestic Russian gas prices are all over the shop but one would be very surprised to discover if the average was higher than 70. There is a major problem. Russia is losing income from exports from low domestic sales. <coughs> Russia may not view it like this, in much the same way as Iran may not view it like this. Is not this the quid pro quo to its people for being a major energy producer, that they can have cheap energy at home? Yes. But even so, there's waste. Russia is responsible for probably around 50 to 60 BCM a year of flaring of gas, gas that just goes to waste, pouring its fumes into the atmosphere. Russia is also 
in a peculiar position, and I'll come back to it, of being very often dependent on imports to meet exports. But essentially, the biggest single thing is Russia faces decline. Not decline in the resource base, but decline in production from the major fields that currently supply the backbone of Russian gas. This is from the Oxford Institute, a nice chart that shows this is the year in which decline sets in. Now, this chart was, of course, prepared before the real impact of recession was known, so my own guess is you'd have to move the dates along a year or two. But decline is coming. And it's very, very severe. And the question is, where is the investment that will replace it? These are the fields that are going down. Noveje, <coughs> Yambori, Orengoi, and Zapolniani. These are the first fields on the edge of the Yamal Peninsula, in effect. The Yamal Peninsula is the next frontier for Russia. And the gas is there. We are not talking about a lack of resources. But if you look at Russia's investment programs, which go up and down, so that last year they were saying that this year's investment would be at one point 20 billion, then they said 20, 32 billion at the beginning, then 20 billion in the middle, and then they revised it to 26 billion. There is no clear indication of anything except delay for the big projects that they have in mind for developing Yamal. And this is one of the reasons why. Russia is expensive, very expensive to develop. State-of-the-art, extraordinarily complex fields. I haven't spoken much on climate change. But one has to remember, these are fields that are up in the Arctic. These are on the permafrost. Now, you can drill on the permafrost, but what do you do if the permafrost starts to melt? You have to have a whole different set of technology because you have to stabilize the permafrost underground to make sure you've got stable conditions for new platforms. It's doable. Everything is doable. It's just expensive. And the question is, what's the technology and where's it going to come from? Essentially, a slide simply showing what Gazprom hopes it's actually going to do. And bearing in mind the difference between actual and uh, forecasts are usually tend to be out of kilter with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that logically, the European Union, as the world's biggest importer, should have a good relationship with the world's biggest exporter. So why don't they? In the end, it comes down to a fundamental difference of an approach to how you tackle energy issues. The European Union is essentially trying to create or believes that he's trying to create an open, competitive market and to let the market decide as much as possible. There are exceptions, and I'll come to one notable one later. Russia, on the other hand, still essentially would like to see a world in which it can plan for everything. And they have a point. They want to know what is the European Union's policy on gas imports and what it will do to guarantee them over the long haul. Because gas is an essentially long-haul bilateral relationship. You want to know that if you sign up to an agreement now, which may not yield returns for 10 years, if you're going to be developing the facilities, that your agreement is going to be in place for 10 years. You need long-term agreements. And the European Union essentially doesn't like that concept. So the Russians have a good point there. But at the same time, how do you cope with Russia's belief in monopolistic practices? <laughs>
how do you cope with its completely different attitudes to prices, profits, investment, and with transparency? They're fundamental issues that make it extraordinarily difficult <coughs> actually to have a practical relationship as institutions between the EU and Russia on energy. Instead, it gets left, as it always has been, to companies. And Russia, of course, has very good relationships with a large number of very prominent European companies. The point is, though, those relationships, while being good for the companies, may not be good for Europe as a whole. They may, in fact, be a limit on a, mar a hindrance on market development. And then you have the question of what does Russia make of all of this? What conclusions does it draw? The first comment from Alexander Golovin, it's highly probable that in a not so distant future, Russia will not be able to offer gas to the European Union in the quantities the EU will be ready to buy. The first indication, Russia itself is concerned that it may not have the gas available for Europe. And why? Because it actually thinks Europe doesn't have a policy. And if Europe doesn't have a policy, then shouldn't Russia be looking to alternative markets? The answer is yes, of course they should be looking to alternative markets. But are they going to do so in an effective manner? That's a very different question. They've been talking to the Japanese, they've been talking to the Chinese for years. And what is the only concrete supply of gas that is going to Far Eastern markets? The very early Yeltsin era agreements for development of offshore fields at Sakhalin in the Far East. The fields developed or owned by Gazprom or with transportation through the Gazprom network in Russia, remain essentially unconnected to Far Eastern markets and no immediate sign of when they will be connected, despite Chinese entreaties and countless agreements. It's as if the Russians are capable of meeting agreements but do not know how to implement them in practice. So now we come to the Caspian, and we come to the wonderful, great conundrum. Russia has always used Caspian, Central Asian producers in this context of gas, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and above all, Turkmenistan, as a balancing item. When markets have been tight in Europe, it has restricted its imports from them. When markets have been plentiful in Europe, it has boosted its imports. Traditionally, this was done on a very simple basis, which was that essentially they would buy cheap from Central Asia and they would export at commercial prices to Europe. As prices rose rapidly in Europe in 2007, 2008, Central Asian countries got more assertive and Russia felt it could be more generous. And it essentially started moving to some kind of pricing that bore some kind of relationship to European prices. And in this, they were particularly helped by the fact that they were starting to impose world prices on one of their main customers, Ukraine. Now, I've not dealt particularly with the Ukraine crisis, and I'll try and come back to it, and I'll certainly come back in questions if you want. But the key point here is that... <coughs> So long as Ukraine, that, that the triangular relationship was not, the relationship involved was not a, a bilateral relationship, Russia, Ukraine. It was a triangular relationship, Turkmenistan, Russia, Ukraine. Because it was essentially Turkmen gas that was being delivered to Ukraine. So therefore, from a Russian point of view, if the gas was being sold to Ukraine at low levels, at low prices, and coming from Turkmenistan, where it was bought, all they really had to cover for themselves was the transport cost. That changed when they started imposing much higher, more commercially related prices on Ukraine. The Turkmen's 
who historically had always thought they'd had the right to sell directly to Ukraine and simply use the Gazprom system as a mechanism for delivery, had been mightily put out in 2004 when they discovered this was not the case and that Russia was, in effect, operating a system of purchasing gas at one price and selling at a much higher price. But it has an impact. Gradually and steadily, the Turkmen started demanding higher prices and getting them, as they did indeed with Iran. But what happens when the market collapses? This is the uh, biggest single problem that they face. If you look, imports from Central Asia in 2008 were 60.4, from 35.8 in 2009. Imports from Kazakhstan were essentially the same at about 8 or 9. Imports from Uzbekistan were essentially the same at about 14 or 15. It was imports from Turkmenistan that took the entire hit a decline of something like 25 BCM, maybe more. My guess is that from an estimate of around 40, could have been more, could have been 44 BCM in 2008, they went down to about 15 BCM in 2009. How did this happen? There is a problem when dealing with Russian gas supplies not to Europe or the European Union, or at least not to the West European members of the European Union, which is that you get explosions. Some of them, Moldova, almost certainly a product of simply poorly maintained equipment and lines. Some of them are far more controversial. The 2006 ones on the approach to Georgia, a whole string of explosions that hit gas and electricity lines to Georgia. A very controversial one that is extraordinarily worrying that people still do not know what to make of it, the explosion that damaged the BTC line 36 hours before the fighting in Georgia broke out. But from our perspective here, the most important because it's the most clearly chronicled. The explosion on the 9th of April 2009 at Kilometre Station 487. What happened? The Russians had a problem. Demand from Europe was drying up, but they had an agreement to import something like 40 or 45, maybe even as much as 50 BCM coming from Turkmenistan. The local subsidiary of Gazprom operating the pipeline in Turkmenistan at that point sent a notice to the Turkmen authorities saying, we're going to reduce the valves in the pipeline system to curb the amount of gas flowing through, and we're going to do that in 24 hours. The Turkmen said, do you know how many terminals feed into the system that we're going to have to switch off? It's going to take us 72 hours to go around and make sure that we've reduced the pressure at our end of the system. The Russians said, you've got 24 hours. 27 hours after the first Russian warning, a gas bubble blew just before the Uzbek border at kilometer 487. In effect, the Russians engineered an explosion that stopped the flow of gas through the line. And the most significant aspect of this was that when the line was repaired three or four days later, the Russians cited force majeure, saying that as the line had been disrupted, they were no longer bound to take any further supply of gas. A little gas trickled out via other lines, but essentially Turkmenistan's gas to Russia was more or less cut off. Right, OK. And another warning from Russia. Only three countries can be supplied for pipeline gas in the long term. Russia, Iran and Qatar. Where is Turkmenistan? And why is it important 
Well, I'll come to why it's important particularly. I'm going to skip bypass pipelines, but I'll come back to them, I promise. It's important because there are relatively few genuine gas exporters. Most gas exporters, most gas producers, are essentially oil producers who have gas as a sideline. For them, the priority is exporting oil, not gas. Even Russia earns something like three times as much in an ordinary year from its oil exports as from its gas exports. But Azerbaijan doesn't need particularly to export its gas. But because the gas is being developed by commercial companies, they do need to export the gas that they're producing. So there's a genuine reason there for export. Turkmenistan is one of only two countries that essentially only produces gas, not oil. Yes, there is a certain modest amount of oil that it produces, but it's fundamentally a gas producer. The other country in the same boat is Trinidad and Tobago. And it has the world's fourth biggest, probably, gas field, maybe even one of the world's very biggest gas fields, South Yolaton. Minimum estimate, four trillion cubic meters, generally assumed by the field's developers and auditors, rather, Gaffney Klein, to have probably about six as a median case. That is one heck of a lot of gas. And Kazakhstan has gas essentially associated with its big giant oil fields. It's more a question for the future than for now. But here we come to the whole question of why these countries are important. Logically, we should be looking to the Gulf. The Gulf has 40% of the world's gas reserves. There are six countries that between them dominate the world's gas reserves. Russia, and then in the Gulf, Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkmenistan. Of those, only three are real, genuine mass exporters. Russia, Qatar, and Turkmenistan. Even Qatar actually earns more money from oil. And even when it is actually at peak gas production, will still most likely be earning more money from oil. So what about Iran, holder of the world's second largest gas reserves? A net, a net importer for the last 10 years. What about Saudi Arabia? Has an embargo on exports. Doesn't want to see them, wants to use the gas domestically. What about the UAE, developer of one of the world's early LNG plants? Now a net importer. Why should this be so? If you make your money from oil, you use gas to maintain the pressure in the oil fields. If you're a big industrialising country like Iran, you use gas as a substitute for oil wherever you can on the domestic market, and you use it to develop your industry. These are not silly things to do. They make sense. But they do mean that you're not an exporter. And when they look, when you look at Iran's gigantic gas exploration plans, all the major developments that they're doing at the South Pass field, which are truly impressive in, in a genuine manner, there's only one thing. The export projects they have in mind, essentially, are LNG. Go back to the early 2000s, before the nuclear issue really started to dominate everything. The Iranians would tell you at the time that they were months, sometimes they even said weeks away, from final agreements to developing LNG schemes. They never did reach that final agreement. And the reasons were essentially because the Iranian domestic 
business system did not match that of the Western companies whose technology they wished to acquire to develop the LNG. The, Western, the partnership terms offered to the Western companies were simply not good enough. And there is no real reason to believe that even in the absence of the nuclear issue today, that much would have changed. Now, there's one exception I make for Iran in terms of conventional gas exports by pipeline. If you look, for instance, at the pipeline to India that has been talked about for the last 10 or 15 years, the Iranians will tell you that they are 50, 60 percent complete in terms of getting the line to Pakistan, which is true. They've got the line to Iran Shah. And what is happening at Iran Shah? That is the great Iranian gas base, a new gas industry hub. It's domestic. Pakistanis will tell you they expect to get the gas in 2015, and even then they're not quite sure how much they'll get. And even then, they've been told they won't get it in winter, which is exactly when they want it. So that's the general approach. The specific exception is if somebody offered Iran a cast iron way of delivering 10 BCM or so to Europe, and that's a figure I plucked from the air, I think they'd jump at it precisely because if they could do that without jeopardizing their current position, whatever it is in developing nuclear materials, it would give them an entry into the European energy security scene. And I think they would move heaven and earth to deliver that 10 BCM of gas. But I don't think it's going to come back. Minister Salah said, big timetable. They ran out. Their income collapsed. And yet they're still funding major programs. Why? Because essentially they borrow from China. Look at the green line. This is where Europe differs from China. Chinese came in July 2007. They've been having a previous pilot over the last two pre previous two years. But essentially, they signed the agreements in July 2007. By December 2009, they had completed the physical construction, and the first gas actually was crossing into China through a brand new 2,000-kilometer system. That is very, very, very impressive. Russia can't do it. Europe can't do it. China could. And that's going to grow three or four years to 40 BCM, an enormous amount of gas. Why have I put the map up to show what are the various alternatives that you can have? What's actually there? and what might be done in future. And the biggest what might be done in future is to get Turkmenistan gas to Europe via a Trans-Caspian pipeline and or via Iran. I like this map because I think it shows, despite it being in French, it has the sort of sense of what are the oil and gas rich areas and what are the simple routes that people want to use. And again, here is the belt stretching right across the Caspian. What's interesting about that is, in fact, people assume that that is an oil belt. It's an oil and gas belt. And indeed, the problem that the Turkmen's found was when Petronas had an oil concession just out here in the Turkmen waters, what they really came across was gas. It's not fair to talk about approaches to Europe without considering Russian pipelines. I think I can do it in three minutes to get over to the end. Problem with Nord Stream and South Stream. Nord Stream is going to be built. It's a reaction to Ukraine. It's going to be built, why? Because they've already spent more than a billion dollars on physically ordering pipe. They've made a real heavy financial commitment. Problem, it's probably not going to be delivering nearly as much gas 
as expected, in the time frame expected, because it was going to draw a lot of gas from the Stockman development in the Arctic and the Stockman field in the Arctic, supposed to come online in 2014. One would make a guess, but I would say 2018 would be a better bet. South Stream, which is this one coming down here, much more complicated. For the simple reason, why should it be complicated? Because when you compare it with the Nabucco project, which I'm coming to, Nabucco's partners have agreed to pay up their equity share. You've got the five transit countries, or the gas companies, five transit country companies, plus another partner, RWE, and possibly a seventh coming from France. All are going to pay their due collective 30% from their own money or resources that they borrow to meet it. There's no equivalent with South Stream. It's all in the hands of the two big sponsors, Gazprom and ENI. And South Stream is currently costed, according to ENI, at 25 billion euros. They're going to have to cover the cost not only of the Black Sea leg. Technologically, they can do that. They've got to cover the cost of all the Balkan transit states. They've got to cover the cost, probably, of an Adriatic crossing. <coughs> and we have no idea at all how they're going to finance it at a time when Gazprom finances may not be quite as constrained as they were, but are still not terribly good. This is just simply what I do on my holidays. <laughs> I go to Uzbekistan and I find a Chinese truck delivering pipe that actually shows that they really do get ahead with building pipelines. So I got the taxi that I was in to stop and got out and took a quick picture. Hmm. Sorry. Right. Okay. Now, when it comes to looking westwards, the Turkmens have changed their attitude. They've long talked in principle about the idea that they would like it, and they still maintain their view very strongly that it is for others to bring pipelines to Turkmen's borders, Turkmenistan's borders, and then they'll fill them. And they repeated that in the first half of the settlement sentence when they said, we're ready to supply gas for Nabucco when it reaches us. But the interesting thing is that he added immediately afterwards, as early as 10 years, 10 BCM can be exported from the Turkmen Caspian shelf, where Petronas is working. This is the first time they have ever identified a source of gas they'd be prepared to relinquish to go westwards. And what is most interesting is that that is gas that was previously assumed would go north to Russia. There were agreements dating back to about 2003 in that regard. And here's Nabucco at last. Essentially, two, starting, two potential starting places. One, the Georgian border, one, the Iranian border, and an end point at Baumgarten. Except you have to think of it slightly differently. You almost have to think of it as being one single station capable of taking in gas from anywhere and of dropping off gas to anywhere. And this is important because once they got that concept, they began to think we can get in gas from other sources, notably Iraq. Now, at the moment, you have to distinguish between Nabucco as a a project that is being developed by companies, which is the two borders and a spur also from the Iraqi border up to Baumgarten. That is the project they're working on and the psychological way in which people use the term Nabucco. Because when they talk about it psychologically, they mean it as shorthand very often for a broader concept that includes a line that already exists between Baku, Tbilisi, and the Turkish border, which is the South Caucasus pipeline, <coughs> sometimes also called the Baku, Tbilisi, Erzurum pipeline. And by extension, because that would be a feeder line for Nabucco, any line that would come across from the Caspian. So sometimes people use Nabucco in one sense, sometimes in another. It is the missing link, 
But it won't be accomplished unless you deal with the question that it's got to drop off gas in Turkey for Turkey's own requirements, because essentially Turkey is the biggest market in Europe. And you have to consider not Nabucco in isolation, but other projects, most notably another equally important EU-backed project, the interconnecting system between Turkey, Greece, and Italy. <coughs> This is what makes Nabucco work. We know that Azerbaijan has got a giant field, Shah Deniz. One phase is already in full development, and a second phase is predicated on a new agreement with Turkey that is all but complete. So Azerbaijan is, in a sense, the biggest part of the base load and the most predictable. Shah Deniz, too. Though not all of it will go to Nabucco. Some will go to Turkey directly, some may go to ITGI. But what makes it possible at a time of people worried about what kind of supply can go in is probably northern Iraq. Because quite under the radar, a small set of companies have been developing gas resources in northern Iraq. And this is a list of some of the operations there, of who owns them, and of expected oil in place, in barrels, and there's a lot more in terms of gas. And the key point about it is, without anybody noticing, in the autumn of 2008, 180-kilometer gas pipeline was built in northern Iraq, completely without anything to do with the Baghdad government, to connect local gas fields with local power stations. And the Turkish company, Botash, the state pipeline company, has got a license for an extension up to Turkey. Due to enter operation 2011, 2012, probably carrying about 8 to 10 BCM, designed as a feeder into Nabucco, not least because the companies, two of the companies developing Nabucco, RRWE and OMV, are taking big stakes in northern Iraqi production, notably at the uh, Chan Jamal and Cormor gas fields. Conundrum conclusions. We have a series of problems, but we don't know how to relate to it. How do you distinguish between suppliers and transit and reliability? North Africa, pretty reliable supplier, and probably potentially a partner in transit, if a long mooted project to bring gas from Nigeria across the Sahara comes about, but I wouldn't really take that into account at this stage. But it's pretty commercially defined relations, pretty predictable. The problems that one faces, and there will be problems, do not appear to be disproportionate to any kind of investment there or any reliability regarding the future. Russia, very difficult to assess. We want to have it as a partner, as a supplier, but it's a competitor when it comes to transit. It believes it has a natural right to act as a transit monopolist. Then you have an interesting change in Russian attitudes. I should have talked about the Ukraine crisis, and I apologize that I didn't. I'd just like to make three quick observations on it. One, the first six days of the Ukraine crisis were a question of how the European Union dealt with Ukraine when Ukraine's gas, the gas that Russia was supposed to be selling only to Ukraine, was cut off, which you could argue was a, a legitimate pricing dispute. The Ukrainians stopped honoring their obligation to deliver gas beyond Ukraine, and the result of that was the first cold, the cutoffs in Bulgaria, the cutoffs in particular in Bosnia. But the biggest problem was the Ukrainians did not explain what they were doing in terms of saying, we have a problem because we need to direct, redirect some of the flows from our storage in a reverse direction through the main pipeline system. And to do that, that means we have to interrupt flow. Instead of saying that, they simply said, don't worry, in a day or two it'll all be back to normal. And it wasn't. So first thing is, as Toyota will tell you, tell the public what the heck is going on. The Ukrainians failed that completely. 
The Europeans failed. They didn't demand. They didn't insist. They didn't threaten. They should have at least been raising the question of whether they should have been taking Ukraine to court for violation of its obligations under the Energy, Community, Energy Charter Treaty. Phase two, Russia's cut off on the 7th of January, total cut off. Russia is now in default of its obligations to its suppliers, to its customers throughout the whole of Northwest Europe, of, 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 of Southern and Eastern Europe. <coughs> Most important thing to remember, it's Southern and Eastern Europe that gets hit. Northwest Europe survives, no real problem. Ukraine, partnering transit officially, at issue as a market. How reliable a partnering transit? What kind of a market? But the interesting point is, they now pay fully commercial prices, they now receive fully commercial transit fees from Russia. Logically, they should be able to buy gas from anybody now. Caspian, partner supplier, partner transit, and actually, so far, pretty reliable. They've proven it in oil. No reason why they shouldn't be in gas. Turkey. Ah, one last point about Russia. The third point. Very interesting. Russia showed great realism. It stopped insisting on the take-or-pay obligation with Ukraine. When Ukraine's purchases went down to 25, 26 BCM last year, Russia did not insist on payment for the gas it had not taken delivery of, but had been expected to buy, anything up to 15 BCM. That's Russia showing real realism. Of course, if they had insisted on that, they'd have lost their case with Turkmenistan, which argued exactly the same thing. You cut our gas off. You pay us for the gas that you're not buying. Lastly, Turkey is a partner in transit, competitor of the market. I'm not worried about Turkey as a competitor of the market, not at all. Fairly commercial, fairly open system. Wants to buy gas, it's got a right to buy gas, no problem. But as a partner in transit, we now come to the, one of the big problems that there is. As far as anybody can tell, just about every commercial aspect, legal aspect, of whether Nabucco or any of the other pipelines should get gas, the terms under which they should get gas, have been resolved. What has not been resolved is a political issue. Six months ago, eight months ago, it wasn't a political issue. But the Turkish rapprochement with Armenia has caused a crisis in Azerbaijan. If you look at it from the West, from the international community, what the Turks are doing in opening up to Armenia is probably a vitally necessary condition for getting an Armenian-Azerbaijani settlement. But the Turks have been appallingly bad at selling that concept to the Azerbaijanis who looked on them as their principal ally. The Azerbaijanis, rightly or wrongly, in realistic terms, in their guts, feel totally betrayed by Turkey. For the first time, we may have the possibility that at the highest levels, despite the fact that the Western companies are developing the gas and want to export through Turkey, it is just possible that the Turkish leadership itself that the Azerbaijani leadership itself might actually, in effect, veto Azerbaijani gas exports through Turkey. And with that, of course, the concept of Turkmen gas reaching Western Europe via Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. I don't think that's a given, but it's quite shocking that it's now a possibility. And that means there's an enormous amount of work that the Europe, for the European Union to do in terms of conventional diplomacy, tying a political issue in the area to an energy security issue in the area. Last two slides.
I've had conclusions. Conclusions are fairly logical that we should be looking to the Southern Corridor as an alternative. But there are game changers. I've said a lot of negative comments and repeated a lot of negative comments about Russia. What do we make of these two? If Putin were to deliver on either of them, let alone on both, it would be fantastic. A new era of partnership with international companies, a new era of openness in terms of access to pipelines on commercial third-party basis. That would be great. Will it happen? Gazprom has resisted it every step of the way. My own guess is bureaucratic inertia will triumph. And the last game changer. Get to it? Yes. Vastly different. No, that's going backwards. Future wars. Competition for resources. Problems involve the use of military force. Russian policy under consideration says they have to look at the question of energy resource issues in a military context in the Middle East, the Barents Sea, the Arctic, the Caspian Sea, and Central Asia. Are they contemplating a war with Norway, which is the only place in dispute in the Barents Sea? It's quite worrying. And here, the very last slide of all, I promise you. This could change the whole question of Europe's gas balance. Whether it does so in the 2020 framework is not so clear. There are estimates, I heard one from ExxonMobil yesterday, that indicates that they think some volumes of unconventional gas could enter the European market by 2020. But essentially, we're looking beyond that. The reason is, very simply, in the United States last year and in 2008, so-called unconventional gas accounted for half of all US gas production. So how can it be described as unconventional? Mm. Will that apply to Britain? Will that apply to Europe? Britain's got gas, <coughs> unconventional gas resources. Northern Europe has, Poland has, Central Europe has, Hungary has. Probably not as quickly, because this is a far more populated continent much more people per square kilometre. So what happens then? You can't have the gigantic wastelands that are used to develop gas, unconventional gas, in the States. You have to wait, possibly, for technology to evolve a little bit further to make it a little bit better to get at the shale gas and the tight gas. But it will come. So the question is, if we have a gas glut for the next few years because of recession, if we have a gas supply problem 2015 to 2020, is it possible that as from 2020, Europe starts moving once again to being nicely in balance because of growing, not declining, gas production? Thank you. Thank you.